We're here to talk about the Ukraine, and I just want to start off with this. Uh, this was I saw this on the Twitters. It says uh, this is a guy named uh, Malinowski. Tom Malinowski. Yeah. He's a diplomat, father. So it's more important to him to be a diplomat than a father, which I think is <laughs> after. <laughs> that that's really where he gets his sense of self from his job, like like a Marika real man. Anyway, diplomat father, former assistant secretary of state for democracy, human rights and labor. He's a congressman and he represents New Jersey's 7th district, which is where uh, Kurt is right now at Uncle Vinny's. So um, Uncle, he'll be at Uncle Vinny's all weekend. Anyway, so Tom Malinowski tweeted this out. He said, I'm just returning from the Munich Security Conference where national security leaders from the U.S. and Europe gathered to confront the Ukraine crisis. Some good news. I've honestly never seen more unity among our allies or two parties in Congress on any global issue. OK, that's actually bad news. That turns that turns out it's bad when the Democrats, are, as George Carlin pointed out many years ago, when the Democrats and Republicans agree on something, that means there's an extra good screwing coming your way. <laughs> And so this is uh, this is not good. I just want to remind people what what started all this stuff that's happening in right now, the most recent history. There's longer history, but this is uh, so when you're when Germany got back together, reunified, part of the promises was that we wouldn't expand NATO. Right. We're not going to do it. We've been expanding NATO, NATO nonstop. And now we want to do it to the Ukraine, to Ukraine, which is used to be part of Russia. It's right on Russia's doorstep. And NATO broke the promise. We, so we've been expanding. So that's the big problem here. There's other problems. And here, I just wanted, this was a pretty good explainer. It's on fast speed. So, so really got to listen. Here we go. So on Monday, Russia's President Vladimir Putin officially recognized two breakaway areas in eastern Ukraine. Both of them are in the Donbass region. They call themselves the People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk, and they've been controlled by pro-Russian separatists since 2014, with Russia's backing. Now, these so-called People's Republics make up around one-third of the Ukrainian districts of Luhansk and Donetsk, and there's what's called a line of control, with the separatists on one side and the Ukrainian forces on the other. They've been fighting each other off and on across that line for years, even though they're supposed to be a ceasefire. So they've been fighting across here so this is where the separatists are and this is where the uk ukraine forces are um and they've been fighting since 2014 right max would you say since 2014 since there's a thing called the minsk accords and they've never been following them but that's would you say that's what how long they've been fighting or have they been fighting longer max fighting really started in around 2015 but 2014 was the pivot point when ultranationalist forces were invested with a lot of power as sort of the, the, the military muscle, as militias of this new government in Kiev that came into power through what effectively was a coup masquerading as a color revolution known as the you know, Maidan Revolution of Dignity. Uh, and, and officially it brought into power a completely US-backed government that replaced a leader um, Yanukovych, who had been, uh, he's called pro-Russian, but he was basically balancing Ukraine with its oldest and closest trading partner and political partner in Russia. And the U.S. obviously wanted him out. A lot of people wanted him out, thought they would have a less corrupt government. Uh, a lot of liberal people participated in Maidan. And what they got was a combination of the what, the most corrupt government in Europe, the ninth most corrupt country in the world right is now. Ukraine? With the IMF just dumping money in, Ukraine, IMF just dumping money in uh, at Joe Biden's command. I mean, in Biden's first speech in Kiev in February 2015, he said, I told the IMF to give them a loan. And the money went straight out to Swiss bank accounts and everywhere offshore. Uh, they put a billionaire in power in Kiev and hit the street muscle were literal neo-Nazis like the Azov Battalion, uh, the most ideologically and militarily motivated battalion incorporated into the National Guard. And they went east and started fighting with those on the map that are labeled as separatists who are actually Russian speakers who are Ukrainian. Right. So let me who just... are being terrorized. So what's happening is there, the, there's a big neo-Nazi. We're going to I'm going to explain all this in a second, but it's just to give you a thumbnail. Then we'll go into it. So 
big part of the Ukraine military is neo-Nazis for real, right? And it's called the Azov Battalion is one of them. And I think the number two guy in charge in Ukraine is a freaking neo-Nazi. And so uh, uh, they're so they're fighting right over here. Let's let me just finish this video. And and they've been fighting over here since 2015. They've been shelling 14,000 people. And the people here all speak Russian. And um, a lot of them identify. One go. thing to keep in mind is that the separatists lay claim to all of Luhansk and Donetsk, not just the 130 control now. And Putin confirmed that Russia's recognition of the independence of these so-called people's republics also includes their claim to that extra territory. Now, President Putin made another big move. He's ordered Russian soldiers to go into the separatist areas. He says they're peacekeepers. We've been speaking to so I, I, I have he has he ordered soldiers into those areas? There is discussion of it. The Russian Duma has authorized force if necessary, but those photographs were not of any Russian official Russian forces operating within the Donbass region. There is currently no evidence that Russian forces have entered the Donbass region. Okay. Although the, there are lots of claims and rumors and you know, but that seems to be inaccurate right now. So just so people understand what's happening, this is Ukraine. This is the part that we're talking about right here, the Donbass, and it's made up of these two different uh, provinces. Uh, and just so you get a little bit more, uh, in the west of Ukraine, they're pro-European. Uh, they speak Ukrainian, and they look at Russia with suspicion. And then the east over here, they're closer to Russia. They're na native Russian. They speak Russian, and they look at Russia through the lens of a shared history. Be, uh, but and so that's so that's what so the neo-Nazi Ukraine regime has been shelling and terrorizing those people in Donbass. And so what Putin did was recognize that area as its own a separate country now. Right. And so that's going to trigger it could trigger a war between Russia and Ukraine. And a big part of it is he doesn't want NATO to. Uh, he doesn't want Ukraine to become part of NATO, and that's what they're pushing for. So that's part of it. But um, here, and so here's what Joe Biden said after uh, President Putin recognized the Donbass as being a separate country. So I, I'm going to begin to impose sanctions in response far beyond the steps we and our allies and partners implemented in 2014. And if Russia goes further with this invasion, we stand prepared to go further as with sanctions. Who in the Lord's name does Putin think gives him the right to declare new so-called countries on territory that belong to his neighbors? This is a flagrant violation of international law and it demands a firm response from the international community. Now, if I could write that funny, I'd uh, be famous. <laughs> uh, that is just some of the fun. As he's occupying Syria, right? <laughs> And, and anyway, so this is what Aaron Mate tweeted out. He said, for the U.S. project of turning Ukraine into a vassal state while pretending to care about its sovereignty, you could have picked a word. You couldn't have picked a worse face than the guy who helped organize the coup in 2014 and then got his son a lucrative gas company board seat in the immediate aftermath. So this is the guy talking about the sovereignty the sacred sovereignty of uh, ukraine and what did they what did he do and the obama administration they engineered a coup of the democratically elected government in ukraine and replaced it with a neo-nazi regime and i'm not making that up uh here it is i'll just uh and to show you the level of meddling i mean the level of meddling that the united states has not only done in ukraine but russia is just amazing so this is uh Leaked audio reveals embarrassing U.S. exchange on Ukraine. So this is back in 2014 when the United States was try was picking who was going to be in power in Ukraine. And the leaked conversation appeared certain to embarrass the United States and seemed designed to bolster charges from Russia, among, among others, that the Ukrainian opposition is being manipulated by Washington, which President Obama's administration strenuously disputes. So the charge that Russia was making is that these people who want to overthrow the government in Ukraine that was democratically elected and that was uh, friendly to Russia, more so than to the European Union, that the people who opposed them were being manipulated by the United States. Turns out they were. And the audio clip, which I'll play in a second, uh, posted on Tuesday but gained wide circulation on Thursday, appears to show the official assistant secretary of state, Victoria Nuland, weighing in on the makeup of the next Ukrainian government. 
Newland is heard telling U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Hyatt that she doesn't think Vitaly Klitschko, the boxer turned politician who was in main opposi- a main opposition leader, should be in a new government. So here it is. Listen to this. So uh, I don't think Klitsch should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. When I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the U.N. guy, Robert <laughs> Seri. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the U.N. help glue it. And, you know, the EU. And she at the end says, and, you know, F the EU, she says at the end. Uh, So um, she says, I think Yashintyak is the guy who got the economic experience, the governing experience. What he needs is Klitschko and Tehenbach on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, Newland said in the recording. So. We literally did that, right? So we engineered, we backed, we funded all that stuff. A neo, and they're neo Nazis, right? And uh, well, well, not not all of them. I mean, you have a coalition. You have right. So there's a big so there faction. The, there's uh, a big Tian Tianbach represented the the ultra nationalist fascistic neo Nazi part of this coalition. He's from the Social National Party, which carries some interesting undertones in its name. And that's why Victoria Newland, who is now the top official uh, overseeing Ukraine and Russia policy in the Biden State Department, wanted him on the outside because he was too embarrassing to have on the inside. So they got Yatsenyuk, who was just this billionaire liberal technocrat, totally corrupt in power. Klitschko was like a professional boxer who became famous. <laughs> He's like the uh, Ukrainian Schwarzenegger. So they wanted him on the outside because he wasn't really sh- sharp enough. So yeah, you see the uh, US neocon officials of the Obama administration who are totally back in power in the Biden administration. She's talking about Jeffrey Feltman. He's now in charge of Ethiopia, Eritrea, the Horn of Africa. Uh, they're all back in power and they're, man- they're trying to manage the situation again, but it's spun out of control. And here you have them on a leaked call or a hacked call or whatever you want to call it, deciding who runs the Ukrainian government. So it's so absurd when people say, oh, it, uh, Putin is attacking an independent and sovereign Ukraine. It is a U.S. neo colony. That is all it is. I mean, that doesn't justify that would in itself justify an attack on it. But let's do away with this idea that Ukraine is somehow independent. And we can talk about how peaceful it is, too. It's far from that either. So let, let's just play a little bit of the hypocrisy after you know Canada the history. Canada and our allies will defend democracy. <laughs> yeah. We are taking these actions today <laughs> to stand against authoritarianism. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. And then, they, <laughs> and then the establishment got their uh, butt buddy uh bernie sanders bernard sanders is a very good boy he said vladimir putin's latest invasion of ukraine is an indefensible violation of international law (laughs) regardless of whatever false pretext he offers there was always there's always been a diplomatic solution to this situation tragically putin appears inept on rejecting it um it's literally the, the the united states is the people who aren't negotiating, just like Trudeau wouldn't even meet with the protesters to ask what their demands were. Uh, so no, he went into hiding. He went into hiding. Same thing. It's it's the uh, Ukraine and the United States that doesn't want to negotiate. And uh, I want to show you the level of meddling just to get you. Uh, this is from Yasha Levine's uh, Substack. I just want to give you the level of meddling that the United States did when the, the communists, uh, of, when the uh, Soviet Union fell. Right. And this is in the 90s. This is from uh, the U.S. embassy official in Moscow during the 90s. He said we created a virtual open shop for thievery at a national level and for capital flight in terms of hundreds of billions of dollars and the raping of natural resources and industries on a scale which I doubt has ever taken place in human history. That's what we set up in Russia after. And then here literally uh, was um Boris Yeltsin weeks before he told anybody in Russia he sent a private note to President Bill Clinton letting him know well what was he going to let him know uh he was letting him know that he was going to make it possible for Putin to be the next president they're going to rig the election and 
This is what President Clinton said back. That's very good news. The only other thing I wanted to say was that we have had good contacts with Mr. Putin so far, and I look forward to meeting with him in Auckland. After that, we will stay in very close touch. I thank you for calling, Boris. So there you go. So there literally he Boris Yeltsin's getting permission to appoint Putin as president of the country and rig the election just like they did for him. And they did it. And uh, the shocker in this exchange is that Clinton gives Yeltsin tacit approval to rig an election and put Vladimir Putin in power. OK, so just so you know this, I mean, that, that we could talk all day about the level of meddling the United States has done in Russia, which is ma- why it's so hilarious that everybody's been uh, clutching their pearls for the last five years about Russian involvement in our elections. That's so it's really a f- black is white, up is down and in is out. So yeah, as part of that, as part of that deal, Jimmy, uh, Boris Yelt- Yeltsin asked Clinton to defend his invasion of Chechnya or his incursion into Chechnya, and Bill Clinton proceeded to compare Boris Yeltsin in Chechnya to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, uh, very publicly. So, uh, you know, compare that to the U.S. rhetoric about Putin recognizing breakaway republics as independent. And so we helped engineer a coup. We overthrew the democratically elected government in Ukraine. We helped do that. And a big part of that government is interwoven into their government is neo-Nazis. It's a, uh, uh, so after uh, that, there was a ceasefire, right? And so they had the Minx, Minx, I don't know why I can't say that, Minx agreements. And there was supposed to be a ceasefire, a military withdrawal, and there was supposed to be elections held in rebel-held areas. But none of that happened, right? They never stopped shelling and there weren't those there wasn't a military withdrawal and there wasn't elections uh, in rebel held areas. Right. So, again, uh, it was Ukraine government, meaning, you know, the proxy of of the United States and Europe that were breaking the agreement. Correct, Max? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, it was the Ukrainian government that broke the agreement, shelling the Donetsk and Luhansk republics. Uh, prompting them to form their own self-defense militias. And if you actually look at UN statistics on deaths, casualties, the lion's share is on the side of those in the Russian-speaking republics that comprise the region of Donbass. So 81% of deaths between 2018 and 2021 of civilian casualties were in the Donbass region. And so this is Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, bombing an area that the U.S. media and U.S. government considers Ukraine. But when he bombs them and shells them with artillery and kills civilians, the U.S. media and the think tank hacks and the Biden administration and before that, the Trump administration, they refer to that population as Russian separatists, and they basically delete them as Ukrainians. But now that Putin has been poised to recognize that population as independent and place them under the protective umbrella of his military to stop these attacks, along with an assault on their language and their uh, religion and heritage, they are referred to as Ukrainians. So the U.S. would never have said, oh, Zelensky was bombing his own people the way they said that about Gaddafi or Assad. And now they're claiming, oh, that these are just Ukrainians, when for years, the humanity of these people and their national identity uh, was completely erased. I mean, the hypocrisy is staggering. So here, yeah, so here's what you were talking about. Uh, Yeah. According to UN figures from 2018 to 2021, 81.4% of the civilian casualties in the Donbass war came in rebel-held territory. 16.3% were in Ukrainian government-controlled territory. So the point he's making is the one same one you are, is that the people who are being killed here are uh, Ukrainians in in the rebel-held area. So it's not... Uh, it's the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in the Donbass. It's not the people in the uh, government-held territory. So this is considered, you know, like kind of a, a slaughter in a sense, right? And so, in fact, 
Uh, here's another. My study showed, this is from Avan Kachkanavsky. He says, my study showed the same. Ukraine has mainly not been fighting Russia's armed forces in the Donbass. The vast majority of rebel forces consist of locals. So, in fact, here they even, this is in Foreign Policy Magazine. Crucially, however, Ukraine has mainly not been fighting Russia's armed forces in the Donbass. Yes, Russia has armed, trained, and led the separatist forces. But even by Kiev's own estimates, the vast majority of rebel forces consist of locals, not soldiers of the regular Russian military. Indeed, the Russian armed forces engaged directly in the fighting only twice in August, September 2014 and January, February 2015, with limited capabilities, although both episodes ended in crushing Ukrainian defeats. So that, uh, so this idea that they're fighting Russian soldiers and all that stuff, they're not. They're fighting locals, Ukrainians. And as you pointed out, when it's convenient for the United States to consider them Russian separatists, they're Russian separatists when Ukraine is bombing them. But then when uh, Russia acknowledges their independence, they all become Ukrainians. So, and here's an interesting, yeah, go ahead. I actually, I actually just interviewed one of those fighters um, at the gray zone. You can just go to our YouTube channel and he's actually a foreign fighter from Texas who volunteered with a communist faction that formed a battalion within the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, and they fought against the Ukrainian regular military and the uh, extreme right-wing militias his name is Russell Bentley. They call him Texas in Donetsk. And he uh, fought with the Nova Russian army. And he described to me what the situation was on the ground. There are no Russian forces there. Certainly Russia was supportive of what they were doing, but they pulled together starting with pretty much nothing and have become a pretty formidable fighting force. Uh, but these are just local people, people on the ground there. Uh, and they were supposed to, according to the Minsk agreement, they were supposed to stop shelling them and they were supposed to take their military out. And they didn't do any of those things. And so after eight years of them not following the agreement, finally, Vladimir Putin recognized them as separate countries. Right. Is it, That's what happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he lost 10 friends to shelling and attacks. Uh, many other friends had their legs blown off, their arms blown off yesterday. When I interviewed him, they were shelled near where he lives. He lives five miles from the front lines. They were shelled with grad rockets, uh, which is, you know, for the, for the first time in years, grad rockets rained down uh, as a message, I guess, to the Russians or uh, to the local population. But that's what they've been suffering for years. Uh, and that just, that, that's just the military component. There's a political component and the Russian speaking population inside Ukraine has suffered massacres uh, and oppression. For example, the burning of protesters in the city of Odessa in broad daylight by neo-Nazi forces. They ran into a union hall and were burned alive by neo-Nazi forces after setting up a kind of Occupy tent style protest. And we, we covered that in our discussion, but this happened in broad daylight and the US and U.S. said nothing. So, well, well and, and I see you're about to you're about to. Well, let me just on give that. give people some more background. Yeah. One in six Ukrainians is an ethnic Russian. One in six Ukrainians is an ethnic Russian, and one in three speaks Russian as an uh, as a native language. So, a third of the country speaks Russian as their first language, which is something. That's really some. So you see. It's a complicated issue, and there's much more history to go into. Uh, but here is a poll. Um, this is from As Per Reports. It says, what Ukrainians feel. 70% reject one people thought, meaning that Ukrainians are all one. Uh, even though that's what Zelensky said when he was running for office, he said that they were all one. 72% uh, consider Russia a hostile state. 33.3% are ready to take up arms against Russia. 21% are ready to stage civil resistance. 67% want to join the e, uh, European Union. But, I mean, that also means that 33% don't, which is, and then, which is like one in three. 59% uh, want to join NATO, 
right? Which is, and then again, 40% don't. So um, I think we lost Max. I think we lost Max's, uh, I think his, uh, his, oh, here he's back. No, you got me. I'm just uh, letting some guests in. Oh, okay. So. I didn't know what you were doing. So, uh, so that just, I just want to give people a background. So you, now you get how many people are actually ethnic Russians. Oh, a third of the countries, their first native language is Russian. Um, and so did you see this, Max? I thought this was interesting. So this guy, Kit Clarenberg, tweeted out. He said, probably just a coincidence that a 2016 RAND paper. Now, RAND is the organization that it's, it's an, it works for the Pentagon, right? So they work for the Pentagon. Uh, it's a paper strategizing around war with China stressed the need for a NATO buildup in Eastern Europe in order to take out Russia or at least prevent it from assisting Beijing. And months later, NATO troops arrived in the region in droves. And so here, I'll, 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 I'll see if we can read it. It's just NATO could neutral. So inter international response could, on balance, also favor the United States in a long and severe war. They're literally talking about war with Russia. The support of the U.S. and East Al Asian allies could hurt China's military chances. Responses of Russia, India, and NATO would have less impact. And NATO could neutralize Russian opportunistic threats in Europe. So there you go. So I, I, I'm i going to talk more about how bad the news has been reporting this, but... Is there anything? So I hope people are getting what's going on. I, I hope I'm communicating it or Max and I are communicating it clearly. Again, it's another the United States meddled in Ukraine. Uh, we 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 actually uh, assisted a coup overthrowing the democratically elected government. Now that government is infiltrated with neo-Nazis. They've never adhered to the agreement uh, that we the Minsk agreement from 2014, which meant that they were supposed to stop shelling these people, these uh, in eastern Ukraine. They haven't done it. And so finally, after eight years of them shelling the shit out of them, they've killed 14,000 people. Uh, Putin says, hey, stop it. We're going to if you guys don't want to reach them, if you're not going to follow our diplomatic agreement, we're going to now say that we're recognizing them and we could uh, help them militarily. So is that and so this idea that somehow uh, the United States are the good guys here or we're protecting democracy or that we have the right to sanction anybody over anything is crazy and ridiculous. Uh, how, how, yeah. any, anything else you want to add, Max, to this, add this part? Yeah, the, just the idea that there's a moral case for supporting Ukrainian democracy is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, when you add all of this up, three TV stations were shut down by the Ukrainian government because they were considered pro-Russian. That's right. And their station directors and owners were arrested and put on trial for sedition. Uh, there was no court process. They are arresting opposition figures. There have been pro, uh, you know, opposition parties that have been considered pro-Russian. Their leaders are getting arrested. Activists have been arrested, including Gay rights activists have been attacked by these neo-Nazi militias. The gay pride parade in Kiev is all, it always comes under attack by these militias. Amnesty International said that no one is safe as long as these militias are rampaging across Ukraine. Then you have the issue of corruption. You have the fact that Ukraine has seen more outflow, migrant outflow than any other country in Europe. It's become the poorest country in Europe. Uh, and that means that the East has been systematically de-developed. Uh, the Ukrainian government has sought to cause a drought in Crimea by erecting dams to prevent them from accessing water on the other side because Russia annexed Crimea. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. The official language of Ukraine was Ukrainian and Russian. And the Ukrainian Duma, this parliament, that's overrun with over nationalist, ultra nationalist has moved to strip Russian as an official language. The Russian Orthodox Church has come under attack. The church uh, that most people follow in the East who are Russian speaking. So it's an entire panoply of attacks on this population that makes their life completely untenable within the US and NATO neo colony of Ukraine. And isn't it interesting that uh people actually talk about a war with China and that this might have something to do with that. Like to make sure we have a puppet state and we have our military accessible because look at these headlines. So Washington must prepare for war with both Russia and China. 
what in the are you pivoting to Asia and forgetting about Europe? Isn't an opt? This is these are this is really ha- here's another one. Uh, what comes after a war on terrorism? War on China. What the f? Here, uh, America must prepare for war with China or t- over Taiwan. So people really, Russia keeps door open after you. So by the way, so I just wanted to show you this. I, I so that, that's crazy. That so so do you think that that's true? That this has also something to do with the China war that they want to start? Well, that this has to do with the fact that the. Pentagon and the entire national security state apparatus needs to constantly justify its budget, which keeps exploding and bloating beyond war on terror numbers, beyond not post 9-11 numbers. And it's the perfect thing to justify all of their bureaucratic priorities. And by the way, you know, half of the Pentagon budget, like over 50% is spent on contractors. It's spent on people who don't even, you know, participate in any of these wars. It's just a, it's military Keynesianism. So they have to maintain the threat. And whether it's Russia or China, the Pentagon is one of the most, if not the most powerful uh, lobbies in Washington. They spend very little on actual lobbying, but they basically control the media. They have their tentacles in the entire economy of Washington, the whole DC area and the country. So, this speaks to, and, and, and many of these people who are writing these op-eds you see in the Hill or um, you know, the Washington Post, many of them are fellows at think tanks, like the foreign policy op-ed was written by someone from the Institute for the Study of War. This is a think tank funded almost entirely by the arms industry, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, you know, the companies that are supplying the Javelin missiles to the Ukrainian military. Ukraine, Ukraine's basically like, this giant dump for a bunch of American weapons that they'll never use. Uh, they haven't even taken these missiles out of their boxes. They're, in, they're just sitting in warehouses around Kiev. If they take them to the east and start hitting Russian tanks, they're just going to be wiped out. The Ukrainian military is a joke, but they have imported, I mean, in December, uh, the Biden administration authorized 200 million, I believe, yes, in, in 200 million in new weapons shipments to Ukraine. But the number, the total number is something like 6 billion. So it's just, you know, they're job creators. Yes. They Keeping s- this conflict going, it's job creators for a U.S. economy uh, that's just this dying carcass. And uh, I, I just wanted to show that it, it hasn't been Russia that has turn their back on negotiation. Of course, right? So here, Russia keeps door open after the United States rejects key security demands. That was from January 27th. Ukraine won't settle for dialogue with rebels. That's the U- Ukraine foreign minister says won't settle for dialogue with rebels. Ukrainian foreign minister Dmitry Kulaba on Monday refused direct negotiations with rebels in the east of the country. What? Here's another one. U.S. and NATO rule out halt to expansion, reject Russia's demands. Well, who you tell me who is pushing for a confrontation? It's the West. It's the United States. Ukrainian foreign minister rejects special status for areas controlled by separatists. That's from February. So uh, it uh, Again, I've seen the reason why I, I, I'm showing you all this is because I can't believe how bad the coverage has been on this. If even from people on YouTube, right, especially, or, or maybe especially, <laughs> maybe especially from people on YouTube, uh, the whole everybody was was laughing at Kyle Kalinsky's unbelievably horrible take the other day on this. And um, um, well, here, let's keep let's show you the rest of the here's some mainstream news media that's just stoking the fans. You ready for this? Uh, this is from this is from the Washington Post writer, a scoop from John Hudson. He says, U.S. says Russia is compiling a list of Ukrainians, quote, to be killed or sent to camps following a military occupation. The allegation is in letter to the U.N. sent Sunday and obtained by the Washington Post. My latest. And. I love. So Aaron Mate had the perfect response. He said, jokes aside, this ranks as one of the most cynical and offensive U.S. intelligence propaganda attempts ever. Up there with the Gaddafi's mass Viagra pills or Kuwaiti babies being seized from incubators. Remember that? I remember that. Those are good times. Um, so they're still doing it. 
the there so when you go to the that's the thing you used to go to the YouTube and they would tell you the truth about it usually but now they're all telling you bullshit about it um so of course not over at the gray zone you guys are getting it right over there and pushback <laughs> correct you guys are getting well, yeah it? all right good all right yeah and yeah and we're, and we're hitting all the algorithms on YouTube I mean, they're just bumping us up at the top of everybody's <laughs> feed, counteracting all the war propaganda you see. So, and what does this tell you? This tells you that your government, so when this guy tweets this out, that he just got back from the Munich Security Conference, and uh, I've honestly never seen more unity among our allies our, or our two main parties in Congress on a global issue, talking about Ukraine. That's horrible. And he he's said, not just some guy. He's not just some guy. Putin appeases the and apologists say we could avoid a war by giving into his demand that Ukraine never join NATO. That's a pretty reasonable demand, by the way. They forgot Ukraine made that promise in 2010 and Russia still invaded it four years later. What what is what is that? What? Well, I mean, what happened between 2010 and 2014? It's like Russia just invaded it for fun. Like, <laughs> Right, we're just bored of Russia, you know. Let's get some. So here's some here's some, some new stuff. Here's some more of the Washington Post. Here's New York Times. Let's, now this to me also rubbed me the wrong way. Two Republicans running for Senate in Ohio have taken sharply different positions over the Ukraine Russia crisis. It's a skirmish that pits Trump style America first isolationists against more traditional hawkish Republicans. What? They somehow made hawkish Republicans try to sound nice. Did you hear? Did you? Isn't that amazing? Can you believe they? That's amazing to me. I don't know. You have any response to that? Yeah, it's, it's a, the Democrats are freaking out that uh, there is a faction within the Republican Party that doesn't want to send uh, all the boys from Scranton to Spokane to fight and die for some uh, U.S. neo colony thousands of miles away. <laughs> that's terrifying to them. That is. And so they're siding with the traditional hawkish Republicans, Lindsey Graham, who said it would be worthwhile to kill a lot of Koreans in order to teach North Korea a lesson. That's their, that's their new hero. He's their new John McCain. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how they've, so if you're against war, they have to paint you as some kind of crazy isolationist Trumper. So anybody who's against war in Ukraine is a crazy isolationist Trumper. Why don't you just go be a nice war hawk? All right. But they're, tra they're traditional. They're traditional. They're, they're very, like, very, very, it's like more American to want. To yeah. Bomb. Tradition. We traditionally to like have to have a nuclear war. We traditionally are like Dr. <laughs> Strange Love. Hi, everybody. We're doing stand up comedy dates in Los Angeles on February 26th and March 4th. And March 22nd and 24th, we're going to Houston and Dallas, Addison, Texas. Go to jimmydorecomedy.com for a link for all our tickets. Hi. 